Thank you, Christian. Um, so today I'll be talking about network control of phenotypic plasticity in cancer. Um, just a little bit of an overview of what I'll go through. So first I'm gonna talk about why we need to build networks to characterize cancer cell identity. And then I'll talk a little bit about how we actually build those networks, um, specifically the uh, network model that Christian mentioned we recently published on um, in a type of lung cancer known as small cell lung cancer. Um, and to go along with that, I'll talk about our method for fitting the rules um, of this network, which is a method that we developed called Bouillabaisse. And lastly, I'll talk about how to control a network and therefore cell identity uh, with some stability analysis and in silico perturbations. Okay, so first, how do we actually define cell identity? So cell identity can be defined in multiple different ways, um, but generally it's thought of as the array of functioning proteins in a cell that cause the cell to have a specific set of behaviors. Um, so that might be in terms of interactions with other cells, how it interacts with its environment, um, or how it responds to external signals and perturbations. So for example, um, this is an example of differentiation of several types of lung cells. Um, and so even though all of these cells may have the same genome, they all have very different phenotypes. Uh, so for example, the ciliated cells can move air and particles in the lung. Um, the club cells have a different role where they produce surfactant to protect the lung. Um, PNEC cells can help when there's lung injury. So they all have very different behaviors even though they have the same genome. Um, and this phenotype that we talk about, or the cell identity, can be defined um, by the dynamics of transcription factor regulation. So just a quick example of um, regulation by transcription factors. So these are proteins that bind to genes and either upregulate or downregulate um, the expression of those other genes. And these genes don't op operate independently. So they actually, the interactions between these transcription factors can form a network. And the dynamics of that network is what uh, can define dynamics of cell identity or cell state. So for example, um, if we have a cell that starts in a state with low uh, gene A expression and higher gene B expression, um, and we give it an external signal at time zero, then we might see a change in the phenotype represented in change um, in the expression of these transcription factors. So this might be an example of a basal cell turning into a club cell with the previous example. So importantly, um, because this single network under different conditions can produce very different phenotypes, um, we would say that the network is capable ex of explaining multi-stability of cell phenotypes that share a single genome. Um, so if you were here a few weeks ago and heard John's talk, you might be familiar with um, the idea of a phenotypic landscape. Um, today, I'll just be using it mostly as a visualization tool um, and kind of a, a way to understand how these networks are actually working. So um, the dynamics of uh, these gene regulatory networks underlie a phenotypic landscape. And this was an idea that was first introduced by Waddington to describe how cells differentiate over time. Um, so he imagined a cell differentiation process as a ball being rolled down a hill, which ends up in different basins. Um, and so here in this picture, I'm showing just a one-dimensional landscape. So you can ma imagine the x-axis. Uh, each place on the x-axis is a different cell type. And then the y-axis is the potential or the instability of each of those types. So if we pick a random place in the landscape um, to put a cell, then under the dynamics of the gene regulatory network, that cell is going to um, possibly change its phenotype. So if we pick an unsteady state, um, it's going to roll down into one of the stable states. So these stable states are known as attractor states of the network. They represent the cell types that we see empirically um, because they are more stable. And importantly, they are self-stabilizing. Um, so what that means is since they fall in this potential well or basin of attraction, if you perturb the cells a little bit, um, it's just gonna roll right back down to the bottom of the well. Okay, so in cancer specifically, um, cells are defective because um, they 
cannot adequately replicate DNA and distribute it to daughter cells. And um, this might be, be because of problems with DNA repair or cell cycle signaling um, or other pathways. But this causes the cells to be very genomically unstable. unstable. Um, and cancer cells also exhibit what we would think of as non-genetic instability uh, or plasticity. So that means that they're able to traverse the landscape and change their phenotype. Um, this is kind of epitomized by the idea of a cancer stem cell. So cancer stem cells um, are cells that fall into attractor states um, that have similar expression patterns and behaviors as um, normal stem cells or very immature cell states. Um, so these cells are trapped in abnormal attractors that aren't normally available to a, differentiation, a differ, differentiating cell type. Um, and the cancer cells usually fill attractors that are near the top of this hill. Um, cancer cells therefore often exhibit immature or embryonic traits such as high proliferation or phenotypic plasticity. So this is important because uh, plasticity may allow these cancer cells to cope with future treatment. So if we think of a tumor as just a collection of cells, if we had a tumor like this where all the cells look the same and they can't change their phenotype, we might imagine a phenotypic space looking like this to represent it. Um, and if we were to add a drug that targets the red cells, we would just kill those cells. And because they can't move, um, they will either die um, or just stay there. So what normally happens in actual tumors is that we see these tumors being very heterogeneous. So instead of being a population of a single type of cell, there's usually lots of different cell types within a single tumor. And these cells, furthermore, are very plastic. And so if we were to add a drug that targets red cells to this um, tumor, we might see a decrease in the number of red cells in that tumor. Uh, but we also might change the landscape. We might change how cells are moving within the landscape. And so eventually, we'll get relapse of the tumor. And the relapse tumor will be very different than the one that we started with. So now it um, is not sensitive th to the same treatment. and um, may be refractory. So this idea has been very popular recently. Um, and it seems like there's lots of different cancer types that show a correlation between more plastic subtypes and the aggressiveness of the tumor. So we see in prostate cancer, in breast cancer, in melanoma, um, the same story of phenotypic plasticity being a mechanism for acquired resistance. So the question becomes, how are these cells actually changing or maintaining their phenotypes? Um, and then a follow-up question is, can we actually control these processes and push cells towards a more favorable state? So by push, I mean reprogram the cells. Um, and a more favorable state would be a drug-sensitive state where we can treat it. So instead of trying to find drugs that um, can target each of our different cell types, we're trying to essentially move the tumor cell types to the drugs that we already have. So to do this, we need to understand the underlying network, as I've said. So network inference involves two main components, uh, structure and dynamics. So uh, the first part, structure. Structure is defined by the interactions of the different things in your network, of course. Um, so here, we're only considering transcription factors so that the network is small enough for us to simulate. Um, but often only structure is interrogated. And so there's this idea of structural controllability where you can just use the connections of the nodes to figure out um, different important uh, things about the network, such as its steady states. Um, you can also interrogate the network for different network motifs, such as feedback loops. And these will tell you something about the stability of different states. The second part of network inference um, is looking at the dynamics, and these are determined by the rules of interaction between um, your nodes in the network. And so this is what we developed Bolibase to do. Um, and this is the part where you need some data to actually fit parameters. OK, so. Um, the dynamics here in a simple Boolean network um, are represented by these rules. And the rules of the network are what tell you where each cell is likely to go. 
So for small cell lung cancer specifically, um, the first step before we really even get started is to actually get some data. Um, so in this case, our data is an RNA-seq expression data set of 50 cell lines. Um, and the, the first step after getting the data is to keep only the relevant information that you want the network to describe. So here we want the network to describe our different phenotypes. So we're going to end up keeping transcription factors that can distinguish between those subtypes. So what are these subtypes? Well, SCLC falls into four main phenotypic classes. So um, we, as I said, have RNA-seq data on 50 SCLC cell lines. And when we do consensus clustering on these cell lines, we find that there's four main um, broad subtypes that they fall pretty well into. And if we look at them in culture, they do look very distinct in culture. So we can already see um, some uh, evidence of differences in these different subtypes. But we can also go further and actually look into the data and um, analyze our RNA-seq data. So this is a heat map from uh, a algorithm called WGCNA, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, it is essentially an algorithm that will cluster genes into groups of co-expressed modules. Um, so it's looking for genes that have the same expression pattern across all of your samples. So for example, in the brown module up there, all of those genes have very low expression in the non-NE subtype, and then higher expression in the NEV2 subtype. Um, whereas in the yellow, it's relatively low in those first two subtypes, but it has high expression in the NEV1. So in grouping the genes in this way, we don't need to look at 20,000 individual genes, but we can start looking at patterns um, in the RNA-seq data. So furthermore, the transcription factors that we're interested in are also grouped into these gene modules. And so we can use this to figure out how different gene, um, gene patterns are regulated by different transcription factors. So the first step, since for our network we care about our different phenotypes and what's distinguishing these phenotypes, we found which of these gene modules could actually discriminate between the four phenotypes using an ANOVA. Um, and the ones shown in the heat map are actually only the um, ones that were significantly able to discriminate the module, um, the different phenotypes. And so you can see there's about six or so that we um, left out right off the bat. So after that, we gathered the list of transcription factors from each of these gene modules and um, did some pruning based on the network structure to get a list of 27 transcription factors um, that broadly kind of covers these different gene modules. So our step two is to then figure out which genes interact with each other, so actually build the network structure. Here we're using uh, ChIP-seq databases to identify the regulatory relationships between our chosen transcription factors. Um, so this ChIP-seq information is going to tell us where different transcription factors can possibly bind to, um, so what other genes they can interact with and change the expression of. So we used a tool called Enricher, um, which is basically a tool that mines a bunch of different other databases based on the genes that you give it. Um, and using this tool, we could mine a bunch of ChIP-seq databases and figure out how these different nodes are actually connected. So are you just taking any uh, connection that has basically been found in any cell type? Um, that, that's a good point. Yes, basically. So we um, only kept the connections that were in at least three of the databases, but yeah, they're in, in different cell types. Yes. Just direct connections, yeah. Okay. So once we have that network structure, um, we want to learn the rules that define interactions between the transcription factors. So sometimes this step is done at the same time as learning the network structure. Um, there's a few different, there's lots of different algorithms for doing gene regulatory network inference. Um, and there's three main method types. So some of them fall into this probabilistic network-based category. Um, and so these are things that uh, may use Bayesian inference uh, to actually get the network structure and determine the rules. Um, 
There are some that use correlation-based methods, and WGCNA is actually an example of this. So you're looking at what genes are correlated across your samples and putting them into um, separate groups. And then some of them are based on information theory. So if any of you have heard of the tool Arachne, it uses mutual information uh, to figure out which genes are interacting with each other. Um, overall, our network structure and the rules of interaction should give us attractors that look like our cell types. Um, so we'd expect to see that our cell types, our data, fall into one of these four attractor states. And so we want the attractors that we get from the network to match the attractors that we actually see. So for SCLC, this is where our pseudo-Boolean rule-fitting method, Booleabase, comes in. And Booleabase um, is based on the network of Boolean rules, which I'll go over a little bit. But it builds rules that are confident just where we have data. Um, so we have one rule per node. So there's 27 different transcription factors. There's one rule defining how each of those 27 um, can be turned on or off. And the dynamics of each node is dependent only on the parent nodes in the network. Um, so a normal Boolean rule will have binary expression for each transcription factor based on the parent nodes in the network. Um, for an example, I'll focus on ASCL1 as the child node, and it has six parents, four of, with, four of which are inhibiting and two of which are activating. So we might come up with a table like this based off our data um, where we look at the different states of the parent nodes in the data that we have and the state of ASCL1. Um, so for example, if all of the inhibiting nodes were off and the two uh, activating nodes were on, then we'd expect ASCL1 to be on. Um, and so we would go through and figure out which, um, which combinations of the parent nodes being on would turn ASCL1 on. Since we have six parent, parent nodes in this case, um, since we have six parent nodes in this case, we'd have 64 total combinations. So a lot of times, instead of representing these rules as a table, um, we can represent it using a Boolean tree. So here we have the six parent nodes. Um, and if you go to the left, that's off, and right is on. Um, so if we were looking at the state where all the parent nodes were off, we'd be all the way on the left of that little figure. So the top. Um, the top row of that table would be represented um, where the 1 is down below. So Oleg 2 is off, T4 is off, on and on. And the second row would be um, where the 0 is. So this is how um, a normal Boolean rule would look. We would binarize the data, try to figure out um, if ASCL1 or any other node is going to turn on or off based on the parent nodes. So the difference with Booleabase is that we are looking, um, we're including where the information about where we're actually getting this data from. So um, we have the same Boolean tree at the top, which means that each column um, is a different state of the parent nodes, which I'll say call a leaf. Um, and then each of the rows is a different um, data point. So the 50 cell lines that we have, um, and specifically the expression of ASCL1 in each of those 50 data points. And they're grouped um, by their phenotype. So for ASCL1 specifically, the NE and the NEV2 subtypes have high expression, and the other two have low expression. Um, so that's represented on the left. Um, and if we look at the parent nodes, as I said, left is off, right is on. Um, and we can look at just a single cell line. So if we look at this cell line and look at the parent nodes of ASCL1 for this cell line, we can figure out um, what combination or what leaf we're looking at. Um, so in this case, this cell line's parent nodes looks most like this leaf. And so this box um, is weighted very heavily. Sometimes, however, we might have um, some data where it's unclear if we should call one of the parent nodes on or off, because a lot of times 
we'll get information somewhere in the middle. Um, so for example, in this case, it's hard to tell if KLF2 was on or off in the data. It was somewhere in the middle. And so the weight gets distributed um, into those different leafs. Is, is the sum across the rows Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they, um, they end up being like a probability. Okay, so if we look at a single column, um, we can essentially multiply each of the weights in that column by the actual expression of ASCL1 in the data and get an inferred rule at the bottom for ASCL1. So since most of the weights for this column are in the NE group um, and ASCL1 is on for most of those, then if we're in this state of our parent nodes, we'd expect ASCL1 to turn on. Some of these cases, though, we don't really have any data. And so the one on the far right, we don't have any data where all six of those transcription factors are on or should be called on. So we really have no idea what happens to ASCL1 in that case. Um, so in that case, the rule would just be 0.5, just a coin flip, um, because we can't tell if we should turn it on or off. Mm -hmm. scale expression yeah. values, but then um, when you're determining whether or not the gene is on, is it, are you setting a threshold? Where, like, Good question, yeah. Um, so in the rule, no, there's not a threshold. Um, I'll get to where we threshold it a little bit later, but all of those values are bet somewhere between zero and one. So um, when we actually simulate this, We'll figure out what state we're in um, and then use whatever probability is in the inferred rule to essentially do a bias coin flip and decide if we should turn it on or off. Um, so if the inferred rule is pretty dark red, let's say 0.8 chance of, um, or 0.8, so 80% chance of turning on, then we would, um, you know, flip a weighted coin, turn it on or off based on that. Mm-hmm. Whereas in a normal Boolean rule, it's just zeros or ones, so deterministic. Was there another question? Yeah. For, for all, a lot of rules in the network, I guess how, uh, I'm not sure if it's getting stability, but like, if you looked at the different Boolean connect, the different states of zero to six factors and how it affects whether on and off, but like how stable is that, I guess? So like, if you, for example, go off, Go from one of those runs to the nearby one. Mm -hmm. Are you less more, less more likely to have like, for example, a red to red versus like really big jumps between like the red and the blue? Which one are um, if I understand your question, I haven't done a, an analysis in that way, but generally, um, I'll get a little bit more into the actual confidence of the rules later. Okay. Um, but I would say it's relatively stable. So if you were mm -hmm. all the way to the end of one of those leaves, mm -hmm. um, then what you would do is you would effectively scan down a column and say basically for what fraction of the cell lines for these sick, this, this parent gene combination mm -hmm. is this thing, is, is uh, ASCL1 on effectively. Mm -hmm. So you're basically building, you're building the rule based on basically, you know, the column. Right. right, yes. Okay, so for any possible state of the parent nodes, we have the probability that a given node will turn on or off. Um, so instead of zeros and ones, it's a probability at the bottom. Um, this allows Boolean base to account for uncertainty due to lack of data. So uh, the weight in each of those boxes, as I said, could be represented as a probability, so they sum to one in each of the rows. Um, and we add in this uncertainty component. So whatever the max of the weights in each column is, one minus that is the uncertainty we add. Um, so in that column where we didn't have any weights, it's all based on this uncertainty um, defining the leaf. So that helps us to avoid overfitting um, leaves that are underdetermined, ones where we don't have data. So the rule um, actually ends up being a combination of the average transcription factor expression weighted by um, the weight with the additional uncertainty term u. Yeah? 
So with this kind of simu simulation, um, you just do a time step. So it's just one, two. It's kind of arbitrary. Um, you can simulate it in different ways, though. So there's asynchronous or synchronous updating. But it's not like an ODE where you're actually going to have time. Yeah, actually, so um, so how confident can we get in these rules? So many of the rules are unconstrained. Um, and this may be because we um, don't have data in that region, possibly because no cells actually traverse that area. So the state, if the biological state is just implausible based on the connections in the network, or because of bad sampling, because we only have 50 data points. Um, so to explore this, I randomly sampled a million states. Um, from this state transition graph. Uh, and so when you look at the distance to the nearest attractor of these states, most of the states that were sampled are about 8 to 12 steps away from any attractor. So we'd expect most of our data points to be concentrated near the attractors um, in our network because we think of them as stable states. Uh, and I'll show that a little bit later. But most of these states that were sampled are pretty far from any attractor. And so when we look at the confidence we have in the rules based on how many steps we are away from an attractor, um, we can see a few different things. So uh, the x-axis on this middle plot is the confidence we have in a rule. So on the plot, it goes from 0 to 0.5. Uh, 0 means the rule is 0.5, a random coin flip. 0.5 means the rule is either 0 or 1, which means we're perfectly confident in that rule that the gene is going to turn on or off. So when we look at the different rules um, according to the confidence for different steps away from the nearest attractor, we can see that for the low confidence rules, um, ones that are close to 0.5, so um, Places where we're far away from any attractor, we're going to have a lot of low confidence rules. Whereas places where we're only two steps away from, it, from it, an attractor, for example, we don't have as many low confidence rules. However, the rest of the distribution really doesn't look that different. Um, so the high confidence rules don't depend very much on distance to attractors. Um, and we think this is because the sparse Boolean network allows us to predict dynamics far from the data. Uh, so since each transcription factor only has about five to eight parent nodes, um, you only need to define those to have some sort of confidence in your rule. And so you can be many steps away from an attractor, but still have those um, parent nodes for a specific rule be well defined. Mm -hmm. you're saying that 1 million states mm -hmm. average 8 distance from it. Is yeah. That, are those attractors of sample states are distance 8? Or you just, or you just like randomly pick in, or in uh, the space and you say, how far yeah. am I to an attractor? So, yes. Yes, so um, I'll get into this a little bit later. I guess I should have put the, it before this. But uh, we ended up finding where the attractors um, in the network are. And then this is showing the um, distance from each random state that I sampled to one of those attractors. So this is like a measure of how many steps the average starting point is to an attractor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, uh, we ended up getting 10 attractors. And since there's 27 transcription factors, um, there's only 270 states that are one step away right, from an attractor. Um, whereas two steps away, there's a lot more. And so it makes sense that most of the states that I sample are pretty far away. Um, because there's 270 states one step away, but there's 134 million total. Yes, Jason. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so we did some of those simulations. Um, because of the unconstrained rules, it can be hard to tell because you end up with a lot of 0.5 rules. Um, 
but we can look at those kind of questions, yeah. Okay, so um, instead of looking at all of the rules for each of the random states that I sampled, if you just look at the mean confidence, um, the mean, no matter the distance to the nearest attractor, is around 0.15, so that would be a rule of 0.65 or 0.35. Um, and we can see that, on average, the rules are more confident near attractors, but not by much. So um, to increase the average confidence we have in a rule in general, um, higher density data, so single cell data, which more adequately samples the space, may increase confidence we have in these rules. So that's one of my future directions that I'm working on. OK, so once we have these rules, our next step is to actually validate this model, so see how well it can ex extrapolate on new data points. Uh, so this is where I talk about the attractors. So attractors from the simulation, as I said, should match the cell line steady states, so the empirical subtypes that we see. Um, but because this Boolean model is probabilistic, we can't determine true Boolean attractors in the same sense. Um, so with a Boolean attractor, if you get to that state, you're never going to leave it. Um, in this case, since our rules are probabilistic, there's not really any states that fit that description. And so we end up defining pseudo-attractors that are states with a higher probability of staying than leaving. Um, in other words, for each of the 27 neighbors of these attractor states, the probability um, of moving into that attractor state is higher than the probability of moving out. So um, when we search the space um, for our network, we end up getting 10 attractor states. And they do fall into kind of four main categories that correspond pretty well with our four subtypes. So the stars for each of the next to the transcription factors um, for each subtype represent what we see empirically in our cell lines. So that's kind of a manually defined um, attractor state. And when we actually simulate the network, we get um, the different columns, so the different states um, of each of those transcription factors. So for example, under NE, there were two attractors that we found. And they differ from the empirically defined attractor state um, by only two or three transcription factors. So if you look at the bottom, um, we put the distance between each of these attractors. And you can see that the ones within the categories really only get up to three or four um, transcription factors away from each other, which is significantly closer than um, between attractors, which ends up being 15 or 20 steps. Um, and so we felt OK calling these attractors um, our four different subtypes. So, so real quick, yeah. This is amazing, but basically there's only two nodes in there that I would say are wrong enough that maybe warrants going back and looking at the network structures. Like MITF mm -hmm. is not in any V1, but mm -hmm. should be. Or yeah, yeah. Like, and then in any V2, it's the opposite. And then the same is true with the uh, SOX 11. So mm -hmm. it should be in any V1, it's not. And then the other two. So have you gone yeah. back and looked at the connections there and maybe tried to? I don't know, yeah. Opportunity to find maybe an, yeah, definitely. Uh, a rationale for why. Yeah. Um, I haven't looked at those two specifically. So MIT F is actually melanoma induced transcription factor. Um, and in other data sets I've seen, it's either really lowly expressed or just zero expression um, in SCLC cell lines, which kind of makes sense. So I think that might be one of the reasons that it doesn't really align with our attractors, because we don't have a lot of data um, for that one specifically. But that's a good point. Um, some of the simulations that we've done, I've used to kind of go back and try to rebuild um, parts of the network. Um, so if we think of the probability 
in like a landscape kind of sense of rolling down a hill? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, so there are millions of states, as I said, um, so it does take a pretty long time to simulate all of the transitions, um, but that would be possible to look at the most stable ones. Mm -hmm. um, so Yeah, so 2 to the 27 is 134 million. So you could make a matrix that's 134 million by 134 million. And I don't know if you could actually do any linear algebra to figure that out. <laughs> but maybe subsets of the network. I don't know. Um, OK, so now that we've seen um, that our attractor states of the network do correspond with what we'd expect, we can look at the actual rules themselves. Um, and so here I'm comparing the actual normalized expression to the predicted expression from the rule. And this is the in-sample error, I guess. Um, so this was computed just on the, the 50 cell lines that we used to train the model. Um, and the correlation is pretty good. So the R squared is 0.84. Um, when we use a different data set and try to predict ASCL1 expression, it goes down a little bit to 0.72, but it's still pretty good. Um, and so if we uh, think of our rules as a um, classifier, so where we're trying to figure out if it's on or off, here's where we did some thresholding. Um, so if we call anything below 0.5 off and anything above 0.5 on um, in the actual expression and use that as kind of our, our true uh, values, then we can change our threshold for the predicted expression and figure out how well we end up doing. So this is a receiver operating characteristic curve, um, which shows the true positive rate versus the false positive rate for each of those thresholds. Um, for ASCL1, this is pretty good, so you want um, your your line to be up near the top left where the true positive rate is high and the false positive rate is low. So that looks pretty good. This is the curve for the in-sample um, data and the out-of-sample data is still pretty good. Um, however, we do have some rules that just really don't do well at all. So this is an example of one of those where the correlation is only 0.35. And if we look at out-of-sample data, um, it goes down to 0.04. So it really isn't telling us much of anything. Um, and the receiver operating curve is still better than a random guess, which is that diagonal line, um, but not much. So this is, again, the in-sample and the out-of-sample error. So we have some rules that do well, some that don't do as well. Um, and this might be a good place where we can look at the rules that don't do as well and try to investigate why. Um, but overall, if we look at these curves for all of the, the rules, um, it does pretty well. This is the in-sample, and out-of-sample does a little bit worse, as expected. Um, but they're still both significantly better than chance. And um, this is pretty good, so we can move on to actually using the network model to make predictions about cell identity. So using this model, we can answer questions such as how stable are individual attractor states? Um, in other words, how likely are cells near the attractor to come back to that attractor? And then what happens when we perturb an attractor by knocking down or overexpressing a transcription factor? So here's where we fo actually followed um, cells along random walks to see where they start and where they end up. Um, so we can uh, do a transient per perturbation, uh, which is really just a change in initial conditions. Or what we did was a consistent perturbation, um, which represents a change in the network structure. So that would be stably, stably overexpressing or knocking down. Um, and we're interested in perturbations that are destabilizing to each of these types. So which uh, perturbations can cause us to jump out of an attractor? And how stable are these different attractors? So when we look at the stability of these different states, um, the way that I analyzed stability was to look at the number of steps it takes to leave 
um, a predefined basin. So I defined basins of different so uh, radius, radii uh, around each of the attractors. So how long it takes to leave a basin that's just one step away from the attractor state and then two steps away. Um, and if it takes a relatively long time to leave each of these basins, then the pseudo attractor can be considered very stable. So this is what it looks like um, for the length of walks to exit a um, basin from the NEV2 attractor, so one of four um, that we found. And as expected, as the radius gets bigger, we're gonna see longer and longer walks it takes to actually get out of the basin. Um, so for the basin of radius one, all of the lengths are relatively short and they progressively get bigger. So if we look at it in this way, we can see the median of the data is just steadily increasing as we get farther and farther away. So for individual attractors, this doesn't really tell us much, but what's interesting is when we actually compare the stability between attractor states. Yes. Did you have a question, Jason? Is there any significance of the variation in how long Sorry? Can you interpret the variation of density? I did look at, into that a little bit, and I couldn't find anything interesting. Um, so I'm not sure how you would interpret some of that. Um, but I looked at like the earth movers distance between these different distributions. Um, and for that metric, so um, just in metrics of how different these distributions are, for the attractor states, um, the earth mover distance like fluctuates wildly, whereas for random states, it's very constant. Um, so I don't, I don't really know what that means, if that's something interesting or not, but that's something I'm still looking into. Okay, so when we look, when we compare the relative stability of these different attractor states in SCLC, um, when we look just at the mean for each of those walks for each uh, radius of the basin. We can see that for four um, phenotypes, which collectively is 10 attractor states, um, they all take on average much longer to leave the basin than just a random state. So um, down at the bottom, that gray line represents the mean of the um, step counts for random states. And um, so that's reassuring. It confirms that these pseudo attractors are actually a lot more stable than any random state that you pick. Um, so what was also interesting is that these are significantly different from each other. So the non and E, the blue at the top, um, is the most stable. And in practice, actually, when we look at experiments that people have done, this kind of makes sense because um, people have tried to perturb non-NE cells and get them to go back to NE, and it's almost impossible to do. But it's really easy to get NE cells to transition to non-NE cells. And so we think the fact that um, these non-NE cells are so stable might be playing a role in that. Uh, secondly, the NEV1 subtype is least stable. And an analysis that I'm trying to do um, that I couldn't get done for this presentation was to actually change the network and add MIC to the network. Um, because for the NEV1 subtype, we know that MIC is a transcription factor that's overexpressed. Um, and it's not currently in the network. And so if we could put it into the network and um, stably express it, would that stabilize the NEV1 subtype? Um, and I don't have an answer for that right now, but I think that it, it probably would make it more stable. Yes? How does the stability of the, or of the attraction or radius, whatever, correspond directly to like, width and depth in that genetic landscape? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I'm not sure if it's an artifact of how we generated the rules, but in general, they just kind of trend upwards. There's, I kind of expected that at one point um, it would like jump up maybe. Um, so at one point it'd take a lot longer to get out or something, but I didn't really see that for any of the states. Um, so I'm not sure how it would correspond. But I would think that the, the non-NE um, here would be deeper um, potential wells than the other types. Okay, 
So here we actually did some simulations with perturbations to the different transcription factors in the network. Um, so again, we're looking at the number of steps to leave a region around an attractor. In this case, uh, we just used the basin of size four, um, which was a, a, um, a relatively good uh, size basin for all of the attractors for defining uh, relatively similar states. Uh, so when we look at the number of steps to leave in blue, that's just normal simulations. Um, we can see the distribution of how long it takes. But then if we knock down uh, one of the transcription factors, FOXA1, in other words, if we just hold it at zero and don't let the simulation change it, um, we can see that we leave the NEV2 region a lot quicker. So the mean um, decreases by a lot. And so we use this as a destabilization score, this change in the mean, and can order these different perturbations by how much we expect them to change the phenotype of these cells. So this uh, figure on the left is showing FOXA1 down at the bottom, um, knocking down that transcription factor. And um, because knockdown of FOXA1 destabilizes the subtype, um, we would say that FOXA1 is a master regulator of NEV2. Um, and in this case, when we activate different transcription factors and they destabilize the subtypes, um, we would say that those transcription factors are master destabilizers of NEV2. Um, and so we can do this for each of our attractor states and um, come up with lists of the most destabilizing perturbations. So the best ways to um, knock a cell out of a bad attractor, one that we don't want it to sit in. Um, and to Um, there are some where they both have no result, for sure. But, but I don't, I don't think I've seen any that. As long as you change it, it does something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and you might notice so a lot the the amount of destabilization is a lot more than any of them can stabilize, um, which kind of makes sense because the attractor states are already pretty stable. Um, so just by controlling one of these transcription factors, it doesn't increase the stability that much. Um, but by changing some of them, it can really mess up the, the um, attractor state. So when you do these destabilizations, do you have any idea whether the states actually appear, or do you effectively just, are you reducing the size of the state space, or are you just kind of, do you have any idea whether you're creating new states? Hmm, new attractor states, you mean? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I don't think it would be creating new attractors. Um, yeah. I think, well, I don't know. If you, if you control certain pieces of the network, it's like you're trying to get it out of the network in a sense and making it smaller. Um, and I don't think you could gain attractors in that way, but I might be wrong. But yeah, that's a good question. Um, so when we do this analysis for each of our attractor states, we can come up with kind of strategies for destabilizing each of them. Um, and sometimes these strategies actually match up across the states. So um, for example, you can see that FOXA1, the one that we just looked at, is um, in this four state Venn diagram for both NEV2, the um, kind of salmon colored box or circle, um, and NE. And so what that means is that silencing it will destabilize both of those subtypes. But you can also see um, that FOXA1 is in red for NEV1, which means that activation will destabilize the subtypes. And so we've used this as a way to come up with strategies to move from one subtype to another. Um, because actually traversing the landscape from one to another uh, requires going through a lot of steps where we don't necessarily know what happens, it's hard to tell if we can actually get all the way from one to another. Um, but what we do know is if you're somewhat close to either of these states, we know what's going to happen. Um, it will either be destabilized or more stabilized. So it looks like all 27 of the 
Not all 27, actually. So a lot of them are repeated. Um, so some of them are, are destabilizers for one and, and a, a um, regulator for another. Yeah. Um, but a good number of them do. And a lot of the ones that do, we actually have seen be experimentally validated. So when I mentioned that any to non any transitions are pretty easy to create, um, that's done by overexpressing rest. And you can see that rest is a master regulator of, non, of the non any state. So it kind of makes sense that if you um, increase the expression, you can force that transition. But we're currently doing experiments to test which of these strategies really work, which ones can actually change the phenotype. Um, so secondly, the stability of phenotypes may tell us something about the hierarchy of subtypes within a single tumor. Um, so we have kind of this idea of how these subtypes are related to each other and potentially how they can um, transition between one another. And so the fact that the non-any subtype looks like it's the most stable, it might be more of a differentiated cell type, um, whereas the other ones are a little bit closer to a stem-like state. Um, and this kind of model actually pretty well parallels what happens in um, the normal lung, so the normal cell of origin, um, follows a pattern similar to this where there's a stem-like type, um, it creates this transit amplifying population, and then that can differentiate into other cell types. So we're currently exploring this hypothesis. And lastly, um, I am working on using single cell RNA-seq to increase the confidence of these rules um, and hopefully update the, the network and the dynamics that we see. So I just want to thank um, my lab and the Lopez lab for all their help. Um, and thanks to my husband, Matthew, and my dog, Millie, for their love and support. Um, and thank you all for being here. And I can take any more questions. Yeah. Um, with respect to the mean time it takes to get away from an attractor as mm -hmm. the radius essentially increases, um, don't you have to normalize those times by like the relative size of the distance. So uh, aren't you comparing, yeah, like if it's small mm -hmm. versus really big? Yeah, so within a single one of these lines, it's not that interesting that it increases over the radius. Right. Um, but I guess the main point here is just looking between the attractors, um, which ones take longer on average. So no matter what uh, radius you're looking at, the non any subtype is always going to take longer to leave that basin. Jason? I guess what I'm trying to say is, if you divide the, the uh, height by mm -hmm. the number of states in that radius, mm -hmm. or like, with, for example, the number of states between rays four and five, yeah. does it still go up as that much? Right. Yeah. I don't think that it would. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess you could normalize it to the random state um, line that I did, because that's just 100 random states. Um, but I did think about trying to normalize it in that way. So, you know, if you're diffusing in one dimension versus two, versus three, it's going to take different amounts of time. And I, I, I don't know how to normalize it when there's 20 different, 27 different ways that you can go. Um, John? You mentioned that you want to stick to your model. Mm -hmm. How far is it in general to add another key? Seems like you're yeah. tuned in. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's not that hard to add it, so I have generated a new network structure with MIC in it, um, and uh, it just it adds a couple of other transcription factors as well because of how MIC is related um, to other ones that aren't in the network. Because we did prune the network so that anything that doesn't have any in nodes or or sorry in do, yeah in nodes or out nodes um, gets thrown away. So all of the transcription factors have to have something coming in and something going out. But when we add MIC to the structure, I could not figure out how to, f or I couldn't get it to find the attractor states of that new model. Um, so that's currently what I'm working on, but it's, it's not that hard to update it. 
and then um, I can either fit it to the same data or fit it to new data pretty easily. Yes? So now that you've identified these masks and regulators and masks and destabilizers, have you gone back and looked at the network to see if you can identify things like feedback loops that these may be part of so that you can see what the mechanism is here? That's a good point. No, we haven't. But yeah, that's definitely a good point. Um, yeah, so one thing that I am looking at is for the stability of the, each of these attractors, if there are specific transcription factors in the network that um, is causing that stability more often, because as we saw with the perturbations, not many are very like stabilizing, but there's obviously something stabilizing them. Um, but in terms of the destabilizations, we haven't really gone back at the network and looked at the network. Jason? Plan on actually like doing these experiments <laughs> with these frames that way, instead of just bagging yeah. gems from your own data to mm -hmm. use the size of the that you can do yeah. the board. For mm -hmm. example, like verify experiments where you get these rules like sense. Yeah. Actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, Yes, so we've generated some new single cell data. Um, all of the new cell line data is from big repositories. Um, and so we've mostly just been using that data. It's pretty hard to get any kind of like tumor samples for SCLC, and so most things are done with cell lines or with mice. Um, but we do have a, a few other data sets that we could work with um, and look at. For the tumor data set that I have, all of the tumors had very had zero expression of MITF. Um, and so when I put it into the network, there was a weird bug with the code. Um, but that's that's one type of data that we could look at with this model as well. Yeah. So I've seen like this Boolean model done for other things, not for mm -hmm. transcription of gene regulation, but like um, sort of like physiological responses and hormones and disease. Um, but in that case, they consider also like upregulated, downregulated, and sort of staying the same. Is there mm -hmm. any like tertiary logic hmm. that could work like one zero minus one? Or yeah, that for that's a good point. Um, for the way that the rules are written, um, the rules that are at 0.5, that could either mean that we had no data and we were unsure, or it could just mean that um, ASCL1 or whatever the transcription factor is, is somewhere in the middle. Um, so when we actually do the thresholding, we could definitely threshold into three different states and see if that helps rule fitting. That's a good point, though. Yeah? It kind of represents maybe a case study where Boolean model is not appropriate or true because it's actually a genetic alteration that results mm -hmm. in overexpression, mm -hmm. forced overexpression of the ink. And so, you know, it, it might be an example where you just say, and we can't get to any one mm -hmm. unless we over amplify the ink. Yeah. This is a master regulator in mm -hmm. the true sense of mass regulator. Yeah. Um, so that, I'm curious to see mm -hmm. as you go forward, like how you integrate MIG or decide mm -hmm. that you know this is actually not integrated into this framework, yeah. which is okay. Right? Yeah. So for MIC, um, it is stably overexpressed, um, not amplified or anything, and so we can represent that in the network simulations pretty easily with the perturbations. Um, so that would just be holding MIC on, um, but. Yeah. It regulates a lot. Definitely. Yeah. So um, in small cell lung cancer, in most tumors and in most cell lines, MIC L or L MIC is actually upregulated. Um, and normal MIC is C MIC is only upregulated in this small percentage of cases. And for the mouse model of this type of tumor, they do overexpress MIC to get it to go the to that type of tumor, uh, whereas normal SCLC mouse tumors don't normally um, look like the NEP1 phenotype. So I think it definitely might be a case of you have to overexpress MIC to actually get that phenotype. Yeah. If I remember correctly, when, when you and David were working some of this mm -hmm. out, the <coughs> rules were based on just a sum of the inputs into a we, the Boolean base kind of took that over 
that correct? Yeah. What I'm curious about is whether or not that can actually give you any insight or predictions about um, co-activity or co-regulation of the transcription mm -hmm. factors on a gene, right? So mm -hmm. if you, in those some of those rules, yeah. it looks like they are almost always together. Right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that could be implied, or you can infer from that, that yeah. those are actually working together. Maybe they're actually mm -hmm. binding. Have you tried to look at any of that in the literature for any of these um, activities? I haven't looked in the literature for that, but um, that's definitely a good point. When you look at the rules, sometimes you can see patterns um, that are based on combinations of parent nodes instead of just single parent nodes at once. Um, so yeah, that'd be an interesting thing to look into. Thank you. Thank you.